Oh, that's good. Praise the Lord. Look over to the book of Nehemiah with me. Nehemiah there, uh, not too far into your Bible, you figure it out. After the Kings and Chronicles and uh, Nehemiah chapter 1. And uh, we have, during these weeks, um, since the, the first of the year, we've been talking about fasting some, and I've had people ask me some questions. And so tonight, I'm going to give you some things. Uh, uh, I couldn't repeat a sermon because I don't ever know what I said before. So someone might say, you, you preached that sermon before. No, I didn't. <laughs> Not unless God divinely gave me the same words because my notes aren't that good. But some of the things um, I will say tonight, I have taught, oh, maybe three, four years ago on the subject of fasting. And uh, fasting is an unusual thing. Nehemiah chapter 1 uh, will be there. So you've got Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles. That's about a quarter to a third of the way through your Bible. And right at, at the course, at the end of the time of the kings, um, Israel, the northern uh, Half of Israel's carried away captive about 722, 586, somewhere in there. Uh, Jerusalem in the southern half is conquered. Most die or are carried away captive. There's a handful of remnant left behind. And uh, the 70 year captivity takes place, and they're, they're being punished. God's whipping his children. And again, uh, if God doesn't do something to America, um, we. <laughs> He, he might owe Israel an apology, although God owes nobody an apology. But, but um, I mean, we've been pretty bad. I don't know if we were ever, we've never been his people like Israel was. Understand, Israel, we don't want to be his people like Israel, folks. You read about the tribulation, we do not want that kind of relationship. <laughs> Just leave us on the outside here a little bit. But, um, but Israel, his, his chosen, his, the apple of his eye, and, and, um, they spend their years in, in Babylon, and many, many of them die, and many of them die down in Egypt trying to, they, get, they had this idea, if we get out of, the, out of the way, we'll get away with it, and God sent people down to follow them into Egypt, and that's probably where Jeremiah died, and, and uh, I don't know that for a fact, but it looks that way, it's the last time you read about Jeremiah, uh, they drug him out of Israel and drug him down to, to Egypt, and he dies there trying to serve these people, and so the captivity ends, and uh, the uh, command is given to rebuild Jerusalem. And the book prior to Nehemiah, Ezra, uh, he comes back to rebuild the temple itself. But realize this is a huge walled city, and the city is a shambles. And so Nehemiah is the king's cupbearer. And just because the world comes to an end doesn't mean you can't prosper and have God's blessing on you. And though everything went wrong there, Nehemiah found his way into a position of influence, a position of uh, afflu affluence. Um, he, was a, he was a man very used in, in Israel, like Daniel was, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the like uh, Esther. And so just because things go wrong around you, my thinking is whatever goes on in America, I plan on living for God. Uh, whatever, whatever happens in our country, I want to make an impact. And you know what's great is the darker it gets, it makes your light look all the brighter. You may just be a little nightlight, and you can still look pretty cool in a dark world. Uh, you know, in the middle of the day out in the ocean, you may be pretty pale uh, in the middle of the, the, the daytime. But, but as this country gets dark, our light's all the brighter. And I have no problem saying let's live for God. Let's have our life count for God, whatever our circumstances. I love that that God used the woman at the well who'd had five husbands and was living with a guy she wasn't even married to, and, and she brings the whole city out to Christ. And God will use who he wants to use, how he wants you. This lady, she got saved, went into town, brought the, the city back, and, and became the evangelist. And so God will use us, and our lives do matter. But we're coming into the story of Nehemiah, and I'm going to uh, just give you some, a little bit of a Bible study, not a normal Sunday night sermon, but I'll, I'll, a little, we'll have a little bit of that as well. So look with me at Nehemiah, these first four verses. And why don't we stand together and uh, just to keep, get us awake. Some of you work a ton of hours. Some of you are thinking about how early you have to get up in the morning and you're trying to get a head start on it. Don't do that. Um, uh, Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 1, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, it came to pass in the month Cheslu, in the 20th year, as I sat in Shushan, the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. 
And they said to me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there are, are in the province are in great affliction and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem is all, also is broken down and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And let's pray. Lord, help us tonight. And I pray that there'd be something said here that would help with each of us. And uh, as we step into another week, that there's some things here that would help us to draw near to you and uh, to learn more about you. And then, and Lord, as we live here in this sin sick nation, uh, a nation that is sure turned from you, uh, may there be some people across America who would bow their heads and pray and fast and mourn and weep for this country who's been so blessed and yet has turned their back on the most gracious and wonderful Lord of heaven. And so uh, we pray for instruction tonight, please, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Keep your Bible open there just for a moment. Broken hearted. Broken hearted over the mess in his own home. Nehemiah gets the message. The walls are broken down. The gates are burned. And you see, without the walls and the gates, there's no protection in the city. Uh, Roving bands of of uh, thieves and criminals and, and wild animals. And there's just the, the walled cities were their protection. And uh, that, that was down. They, uh, Ezra uh, had gotten the temple going and trying to get that up where they get worship started, but there was no safety and there was no protection. And it was just a sign of a devastated nation that had yet to get themselves back on track. And Nehemiah, he's 800 miles away in Babylon. He's a long way, he's very comfortable. He has a position right next to the king. He was the king's cupbearer. The king trusted him and uh, took care of him. And and he was in a very uh, very, uh, desirable position. And here Nehemiah is, a Jewish man who is uh, well set up. And he didn't have to care about about, uh, Jerusalem. Understand this, if Nehemiah is 50 years old in the story, he never saw Jerusalem. And you think through uh, these people in Babylon. Daniel was a teenager when he was taken captive. And uh, Daniel spent, uh, probably spent the rest of his life and died in Babylon. There's one Daniel that you see in a genealogy coming back, but most people doubt that's our Daniel that we think about. But but the people that were in uh, Babylon who came back to rebuild Jerusalem most of them had not even seen Jerusalem. Those who had were really old. They, had, they were there 70 years. So if they were 10 years old when they left, they're now 80. And that's why when the, when the, the, uh, the temple, the, the foundation, the temple was laid, it says that the young people shouted for joy and the old people wept because it was so much smaller. It was so, you know, they remembered Solomon's temple. These are, these are people... 80, 90 years old, and, and they're looking at this little thing that was, that was rebuilt, and, and they're thinking of all the gold and all the, the uh, fancy woods and all this stuff, the richest kingdom in the world, built the most beautiful and expensive building in the world. There's no building in America that could match the dollars and cents spent on Solomon's temple, and they saw that. And now they're looking at this thing. Of course, they're old. And, you know, old people do have a tendency to say, well, you know, back in my day. And then God said, don't you despise the day of small things. That's where he said it's not by might nor by power. It's by my spirit. You see, it's not the building that makes it great. Makes it great. It's the spirit of God in it that makes it great. And our, as I said somewhere this morning, I don't know where I said it, maybe yesterday, somewhere I was preaching, we had, as, we had the, the most amazing blessings on our church when we had a dirt parking lot and a tent and porta-potties. We had young people going off from our church, starting churches, going to Bible college, people being saved, baptizing great numbers of people in a horse trough that, that didn't have a heater. You know, we've got a jacuzzi up here. We rent it out on Friday and Saturday nights, put the bubbles in it, and, you know, got a big screen TV up there. People, people think those TVs up there are for the choir. They're for the jacuzzi. And uh, no, we don't. But, and that horse trough, 
that horse trough was a mess and the bottom got rusty so we put some we got it dried out we cut some green indoor outdoor carpet and glued it down and, and of course that got moldy and and nasty and and I remember one Sunday we baptized is an evening we baptized the beginning of the service and at the end and and I just had a submersible heater you plug it in just throw it in the water and uh, 110 volts going around this round thing and and within you know a few hours it would heat that it's about 700 gallons six foot long or six and a half foot long tank and um, and we just I just plug it in throw it in there well we were baptized before church and I was busy leading singing whatever and so somebody got the cover off took the heater out and they didn't unplug it I just tossed it over on the side, and I went over and baptized, came up right in the middle of my sermon. That thing finally got so hot it blew up. Kapow! <laughs> and those things happen, you know. It's, it's just not a big deal. That's just life. Things blow up. What's the problem? It's not the Marines the only ones that can blow things up and have fun. And, uh, but, you know, it's not, it's not about the building. If it's not got the Spirit of God working, and if the people of God are not yielded to the Spirit of God, then there's no point in worrying about the building. There are buildings all over the world that are beautiful that God doesn't use. God uses people. And so there, uh, in these, these days we're reading here with Nehemiah, he was brokenhearted over the city that was devastated, and, and the nation had crumbled, and there was no safety and no security. And we come in, and I want to read that last verse again there uh, in verse 4. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Now you can read the rest of the story if you'd like. And Nehemiah is allowed to go back and head up the construction crew. And in less than... 60 days, 50 some days, they rebuilt the walls of that huge city. Unbelievable miracle that God did there. But uh, the fact is, Nehemiah loved his country. He loved his country enough to, when he heard the words, he just went and cried. He just cried. And, and he mourned. He just, it just grieved his heart. And he fasted. And if you'll notice there, it says he mourned certain days and fasted and prayed. And God hears the prayers of Nehemiah and, and God answers the prayers. Understand the nation of Israel was a mess because of their sin. America is a mess because of our sin. Um, uh, there's an old book years ago written called None of These Diseases. And it's about a, a health food kind of stuff and natural things and they try to use a Bible verse to endorse their, you know, gluten-free or whatever, but drink goat's milk and, and all that good stuff. I don't care what you do with that. But, but the Bible does talk about if you'll do right, I'm not going to give you all these diseases that I gave to the Egyptians. And it's Old Testament. But don't think God can't use the economy to punish a country. Don't think God can't use disease to punish a country. Don't think God can't use war to punish a country. And God owes us nothing. God owes us absolutely nothing. And as he punished Israel and these years of suffering went on and multitudes of people died, this man, one man, grieved at his heart, mourned and fasted and wept and prayed, and God heard his prayer. So the question, uh, I'll get to fasting, but the question is, has anybody even cried? Oh, certainly we've complained. Certainly we feel like something crooked's gone on. Um, probably a lot of people have been just thoroughly disgusted with the corruption in our leadership in our country. But did anybody cry? To him. Because we've seen this year then nothing in this country is going to fix our problem. Only God. And that's why toward the end of December, we put together that little, I've got my book over there, but that book on revival that it began in me on, on 70 days of prayer and fasting for our nation. Don't, don't gripe about liberals if we've not prayed. Don't complain about uh, corruption and deceit and all. Don't, don't even gripe about it if we've not even been willing to give up a meal. Right. 
to take time to fast and pray for God. Now, fasting, let me just read you a verse. We're going to stay a lot in the Old Testament. I'll read you a verse out of 1 Corinthians 7 if you want to just jot it down. It's talking about a, a husband and wife, and it says this. If you just listen, and I'll, I'll give you the reference in a minute, 1 Corinthians 7, 5, but it says this, defraud ye not one another except it be with consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. So um, there is this thing of fasting is a separating yourself from that which you enjoy, that which is pleasing to you, that which you want to do. And, and, and he said you can separate, you can take time uh, in your home to be alone for prayer and fasting. That is a, a biblical example of New Testament fasting besides food. And he just says, um, you are not to defraud or to keep back that which belongs to another except to be with consent, an agreement between the two for a time that you may give yourselves a fasting and prayer. There is something about fasting, and I can't tell you all of it. All I can tell you is that God talks about fasting, and we're going to look at it tonight, fasting and fasting and fasting and fasting. And there's reasons that we fast, multiple reasons we'll look at tonight. But the point is this, fasting touches God. That's just the reality. Amen. Fasting influences heaven. John Rice, I think it is, or R.A. Torrey, one of them said, doesn't matter who said it because I'm about to say it, and that's enough for you. <laughs> uh, through prayer, we touch omnipotence. Uh, our prayer life reaches up and touches the throne of God, and God acts in response to prayer, but you can supercharge your prayers by fasting. And the fact is, the only fasting most of us like is eating fast. We just, this thing of fasting, you know, I've got to keep my sugar level upright. I can't fast. And uh, whatever you want to do with it, that's fine. But I want us to look for a minute. I'm going to give you several examples. Go over to the book of Judges with me, if you would. Um, Genesis, Exodus, Judges. Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. Look at Judges chapter 20. Judges chapter 20. And I'm going to just skip through a, a few passages here and um, look just a little bit at this thing. Judges chapter 20 brings a, a, a tragic time, a horrible time. And just tell you the little bit of the story uh, a time of carnality, a time of shameful behavior. There was such wrongdoing that they decided they were going to destroy one whole tribe, one of the 12 tribes, Benjamin. It was, it was just a mess. The first, uh, the first battle, Israel outnumbered Benjamin 26,700 to 400,000, and yet Israel was almost wiped out in that battle. In grief, the brokenhearted people of Israel, not the Benjaminites, uh, they go to God saying, what went wrong here? And, and they, they knelt in prayer and fasting and seeking God's help. If you look there at chapter 20, let's just see if we can jump into the middle of the story here. In verse 15, and the children of Benjamin were numbered at that time out of the cities 20 and 6,000 men that drew the sword besides the inhabitants of Gibeah, which were numbered 700 chosen men. And they've got this, this crowd together. Verse 17, the men of Israel besides Benjamin were numbered 400,000 men that drew the sword. All were men of war. And, and it was a tragic thing, a, a horrible thing. A big mess came up. Look down at verse 23. And the children of Israel went up and wept before the Lord until even and asked counsel of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother? And the Lord said, Go up against them. And the children of Israel came near against the children of Benjamin the second day. And uh, Benjamin went forth against them out of Gibeah in the second day and destroyed down to the ground the children of Israel again. 18,000, all these drew the sword. And these are people on the good side of things, but there's thousands of people dying. See, when evil comes into a country, good people die. When evil reigns, good people hurt. And uh, don't, and again, if you die, you know, as a child of God, you go to heaven. But it's a problem if you just don't quite die. That's, that's not good. And so a lot of, a lot of uh, t tragedies there. 
And so look over to verse, uh, verse 35. And the Lord smote Benjamin before Israel. So finally Benjamin's in trouble uh, and destroyed of the Benjamites that day, 20 and 5,000 and 100 men, all these drew the sword and, and suffering and death and sorrow and all these just, just terrible, terrible, tragic things. And in the midst of all this, they, they fasted. They just said, we need God. And we won't, you can read through the chapter there. But in this story, fasting in this story was we're in a battle and we don't know what to do. That's America today. We don't know what to do. If you haven't stepped back saying, God, what do we do? I think the most common thing out of my mouth to God is, God, I got no clue. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. You know, I feel like a junior high guy wanting to tell a girl he likes him or something, but her, he likes her. Um, look, look, over, uh, look over to 1 Samuel. Let's just look at a couple of stories here where, where the people fasted. 1 Samuel chapter 7. You had just passed Judges to 1 Samuel First uh, Samuel chapter seven, and and uh, this, the the stories of the people of God, the ark of God had been taken. It was a terrible time, and and um, hurt and suffering, and um, look down at chapter seven and verse six. Um, wherefore, uh, wherefore then do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts? I'm sorry, I'm in chapter six. Well, I then wonder why that didn't look right. Uh, chapter 7 verse 6 and they gathered together to Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there we have sinned against the Lord and Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mizpah now the the people of Israel the ark of God had been taken and and uh, by the Philistines and the nation again a national problem when a nation is in trouble somebody should fast that these stories, just you, you read through them, the read through, I can't go through all these, we're not going to get to them tonight, but I'm just going to pick out a verse or two and show you where they are. But you read through these stories on your own, you'll see national trouble should bring the believers to prayer and fasting. Now, again, fasting, as you'll see in a, in a minute or two here, fasting is up to you how long. And I usually prefer to fast from when I go to sleep to when I wake up. And uh, that's the best time to fast. But, um, and you know what I'm talking about. Don't act so pious. Yeah, I'm just really looking forward to about four days of fasting. I just, I just love those days. And, uh, man, I, anyway, I have a friend who, he was, I hadn't seen him in a month, six months, and I, I ran into him, and I thought, man, this guy's dead. He's, he's about to die. This is terrible. I found, I said, you doing all right? And he said, yeah, I'm fine. I said, okay. You, you, you don't have to say what you think. Boy, you're looking really bad, dude. You know, sometimes we say things that we don't really need to say, but I, he did look bad. He looked like death warmed over, caught up with his wife. And I said, your husband, all right. She said, he's on a 40 day fast. So, uh, yeah, he's, he's lost about 80 pounds or whatever. When he fasted, he doesn't drink anything but water. And he, 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 he told me, he said, when I fast, I get a new toothbrush. I don't want any toothbrush taste on my toothbrush. And I thought, man, this dude's serious. I just drink milkshakes usually when I'm fasting, but no, not really. These people trying to get the ark of the, go back to chapter 7, verse 1. The men of Kirjath Jerim came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought the ark into the house of Minadab to the hill and sanctified Eliezer, his son, to keep the ark. And, and uh, that they were getting the ark back from the Philistines. And these are just tragic, nationally tragic days. And, and they were fasting. Why? Because our country's hurting and we don't know what to do. Look over to chapter 31 of 1 Samuel. A great battle had taken place and Saul and Jonathan, the king, and, the, and his son, the prince, were, were killed. 1 Samuel 31 and uh, horrible days. Jonathan, a loyal and faithful son to a corrupt dad. And uh, Jonathan lost his life because of his rotten father. And uh, boy, we ought to, you that are dads, you ought to just beg God to help you walk straight, that your kids would not hurt because of your folly. And, um, and we're not going to be perfect dads at it, but we ought to be hitting awful hard to, to do right. And uh, so in a great battle, Saul dies, Jonathan dies, 
and the Philistines found them and, and uh, cut their heads off and they took their bodies and literally nailed their wadi, bodies up to a wall just to show off we killed these guys. And it was just, just a heartbreak, a uh, tragedy. And uh, the men of Jabesh Gilead came along and, and uh, look at chapter 31 and we'll read a verse or two and look at verse 11. Chapter, uh, right, this is the last three verses of 1 Samuel. And when the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead heard that the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and went all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Beth Sheen and came to Jabesh and burnt them there. And they took their bones and buried them under a tree at Jabesh and fasted seven days. Now, that's the first time it said how long they fasted. In the other examples, they fasted. It didn't say exactly how long. This, this, they fasted seven days. Now, here's the thing. You're working a busy job. You're running all day. You get up early. You drive to work. You hustle all day long. You're working, 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 and you're busy with people, and then you go home, and, and uh, you're busy at home. you got family, and you got kids, or you got uh, things you got to do at home, and you drop into bed at night. And, um, and, and you may have not eaten that day, there's more to fasting than not eating. And I'm not picking on anybody. You do the best you can. But if you can get more time with God, that's the purpose of fasting. See, the per these guys stopped everything. Remember the guys? We won't get there. But the, the friends of Job, they show up to Job. He's sitting on an ash heap, and they just walked up, and they sat down next to him, and they fasted seven days. They, just, they didn't even speak. They just sat there and fasted. Their hearts were broken. And, and again, there's nothing wrong with you running your busy schedule and, and fasting, but I would encourage you, if you're going to fast in the midst of it, and some of you, the jobs you have would be very difficult because you're burning the calories, you work hard, and you're very physical, and, and, and you might need to, you, you decide how you want to fast. You may need to drink juices or whatever to get some, whatever, carbs, however you want to do it. And don't let anybody criticize you, know if you fast, you have to do this. You're hard-pressed to find anything you have to do fasting in the Bible. You did not, you, you stop doing something, usually food, so that you go to God saying, I'm denying myself because I need you to help me. That's fasting. And, um, but if you're going to fast, this is just my opinion. Make sure you stop several times a day and seek God's help. You, you know, you, 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 you walk by the refrigerator and you think, oh no, I'm fasting. Then take a minute, bow your head, say, God, I need you. Have some things you're wanting from God. I, I got a two-year-old that's a monster. They're demon-possessed. And, man, God, I need help. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know who the daddy is of this kid, but, God, this kid needs help from heaven. And then go, then get busy again. And then, you know, it comes lunchtime. Normally, you'd stop for lunch. And, all right, you don't stop for lunch. You stop to pray. And, uh, and you go somewhere. And, you, you know, maybe you go by a, a, an AM, PM or a Circle K, and that's where you normally get your whatever. Uh, just pull over as you're driving. And stop and take five minutes and just pray. Some of you work so many hours, you're not going to get a whole day in prayer. Jesus spent 40 days uh, in fasting and prayer. What was he doing? He was in the wilderness. There were no jobs there. He was there uh, wrestling a spiritual battle, him and God, and denied himself food and water, by the way. If anybody wants to be really biblical, go 40 days without water. See how that goes over. And that's why the angels had to come down and minister to him. I would suggest you at least drink when you fast. So these men, they took um, seven days and they just fast. It's okay to fast when you're just hurting. These men's heart broke. Heart broke for their king, heart broke for his sons, heart broke for their country. And again, I hope you care about your country enough to hurt. They mourned. Go to 2 Samuel, just one page, the very next page probably in your Bible. Look at the word came to David that Saul and Jonathan were dead. And if you look at 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, the very next page, in chapter 1 and verse 12, David gets the news. I'm sorry, verse 11. And David took hold of his clothes and rent them, likewise all the men that were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted, what? Till even, till the evening. And for Saul and for Jonathan, his son, and for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel, because they were fallen by the sword. Now, look at that verse, and if you want to... Mark in your Bible or underline some things. Look at this fasting. Number one, whenever they got the news, their heart was broken. They fasted until the evening. You know, it's noontime, and I get this terrible news. I'm not eating lunch. 
I'm not snacking in the afternoon. I just, my heart's broke. I'm spending the afternoon alone with God. And then in the evening, I got to get back in the, you know, husband, wife, kids, whatever. I gotta, I've got to get the ball rolling. They fasted. It was out of heartbreak. But look at what they fasted. Why did they fast? Why were there, was, was their heart broken? In verse 12, uh, they wept and fasted until the evening for, number one, for Saul. That was the king. Number two, for Jonathan. Um, and, and, and let me just be politically for a minute. Have, have you felt bad for President Trump? Hope you have. I'm not real old, but I'll tell you, I've never known a president to work as hard and care as much and walk as straight as he has. And I've heard people say all kinds of bad things about him, but I've never seen it. You know, blind as a bat maybe, but, but I've, uh, I've seen the guy patient and kind. And, and uh, I hate it when people try real hard and they get kicked in the, she in the shins. And um, God knows, but it doesn't mean I still can't care. And if you've not thanked God for him or prayed for him, prayed for his wife, how about, how about you're the, the junior high son who for four years had your dad spoken of like he was? Does anybody care about Baron? You know, somebody ought to care just a little bit. And so that's what we're looking at here. These people, they, Saul was a bad king, but he was their king. And so you notice in verse 12, they mourned for Saul. They mourned for Jonathan. They mourned for the people of the Lord and of the people of Israel. They were, and for the house of Israel, for the whole bunch of them, because they were fallen by the sword. Um, there ought to be some concern. And so your grandmother passed away. If you've not hurt you that know the Yorga family, I'll tell you, uh, I, I don't know a family that I have so quickly gotten um, literally overwhelmed by the godliness of the home as that family. Um, the, you know, the flyers that we mail out, those COVID flyers raised $2,500. And we said, how many did the house that goes go to? 10, goes to 10,000 homes. And um, that's how we met the Yorgas. They got one of those COVID tracks in the mail. And we we're having church outside out here, and they showed up in church. Mr. Yorga's only been in one service. But his kids are involved, looked over to, to this evening and this morning, and, and the girls weren't, weren't in the orchestra, and I just thought to pray for them. And, um, and Stephanie Yorga was supposed to be in the nursery this morning, and I, thought, I just thought to hurt for her a little bit. Her dad died yesterday. And, um, you know, did, when, when there's a loss, can't we, can't we stop and care? That's fasting. Fasting is... Is just having our heart break and say, you know, look, I just got to get away from everything. And, and I'm hurting for them. That's how Christians act. And so much fasting, it's a natural byproduct of a hurting heart. And you hear about a, a, a broken marriage. Well, I'm not going to be critical of either one of the people in a broken marriage, but I can hurt. I uh, hear, hear about a tragedy of some kind around the country of people, good people that care. And, and can we not care? See, see fasting, um, if you've never had anything happen to you that hurt you so bad you couldn't eat, let me encourage you, you will. You know, Job said, I, I lost my desire for food. And I, I would have said years ago, I just don't think that's possible with me. Oh, but it is very possible. Uh, hurt. So they wept. And, and, but again, maybe it was a half day. All right. Go over to the story of Bathsheba and, and uh, David in 2 Samuel 12. Just go over 10, 10 chapters, 8 or 10 pages. There, there was a child, 2 Samuel chapter 12. There's a child conceived illegitimately. The husband of Bathsheba was murdered, basically. Uh, Uriah, a good man, and uh, because David was trying to cover his sin, uh, Uriah dies, a child is born, David marries Bathsheba, thinking he's got everything covered, and by the way, you can't ever cover, you just can't, and uh, it's always good to be clean inside, because uh, it's all gonna, it's all gonna come along, but look at verse 16, uh, 2 Samuel 12, and verse, uh, verse 15, Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. And David besought God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. So now we've got a night in, a night in prayer, just all night. 
Now, I've, I've stayed up all night in prayer, and I've found that I'm such a lousy Christian the next day, it's really not a spiritual venture. I just, it, I can stay up all night and pray and then be busy the next day, but I'm grumpy. Man, I am not a good Christian. And so I need at least two or three hours sleep to at least be a decent Christian the next day. But David's heart, he was burdened for this child, and, and he spent the night in prayer, and he fasted. And, uh, and then in verse 21, then... Um, I'm sorry, verse 16. Um, let's see, verse 16. Uh, uh, verse 17. And the elders of the house arose and went and, uh, to raise him from the earth, and he would not, neither did he eat any bread with them. And it came to pass, verse 18, on the seventh day the child died. So here again, there's a week of fasting. And probably most of you, the kind of lifestyle you live or your health, you probably can't fast seven days. Maybe you can, maybe you can't. But it's all between you and God. This fasting calendar here, the reason for it, and Matt said it best in the teacher's meeting, Matt said, put your name in the fasting calendar because when you decide to cheat, you don't want to be a liar. <laughs> Man, I put it on the calendar. I got to fast now. You know, because it's easy enough to say, well, I'm going to fast on Monday. And you think, well, I'll fast after breakfast. <laughs> then, well, I'll start fasting after lunch. <clears throat> and then it's three weeks and you still haven't done it. And if you've never done that, you're just a better Christian than most of us, okay? <laughs> but most of us have started out a day to fast and we've not made it to breakfast. Let's just be honest, all right? If we're to have an altar call right now, those who gave in before breakfast, there would be many people at the altar, and uh, probably only a couple of you out there that are the, the real angelic or something, but, but most of us aren't, okay? Um, there's all kinds of times. Um, let's, let's go back to uh, a few more pages, past Samuel, and Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles, to Ezra. Now, we started in Nehemiah, this is right near Ezra, and... Uh, I've got so many here, and I'm just going to show you this one, and I'll close. Ezra chapter 8. Ezra chapter 8. And so right after 2 Chronicles. Um, time in prayer and fasting, I believe that if you had a real burden, um, maybe a child, you might just say, I'm going to fast every Monday for this child. If you had a tragic health situation, you might, um, you might just say, I'm taking a day off work. I'm going to spend a whole day doing nothing but griping at God. Nothing wrong with that. Um, I had a situation years ago, um, um, just to, uh, 35 years ago, and, um, and I just, uh, a situation came up, and I said, God, this ain't going to happen. And uh, I just wandered in the backyard for hours and hours <laughs> in prayer and fasting, and I don't know how long it was, but I just, uh, I just wasn't going to give in on it. I wanted something from God, and, um, and I was going to pray and fast till I felt I had it. When we first got our, our first uh, building, we were going to use the Wildemar School to start the church. And um, the uh, school board didn't want a church in the Wildemar School. And they said, no, we don't rent out our school facilities for churches. Well, I started doing my homework. There were three schools in our school district being used for churches. And then I got the school board policies, and it said right there in their own policies, um, our school facilities cannot be used uh, for private use except for nonprofit organizations such as Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, senior citizens, and churches, right, in their own things. So I got copies of all that, and I went to the school board. They were going to have a meeting. I presented all that stuff. I said, according to this, 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 and this, I want to rent the Wildemar School to start our church. And I found it when they were having the meeting. And uh, I went right across the street from the meeting and spent the day in fasting. I didn't know exactly what hour they were having it. And I was not going to give up on it. I fasted and prayed and fasted. And it was like, uh, it was, uh, you know, the light comes on. There was no light and it didn't turn on. But it was, I did come to a point where I thought, I felt like God said, okay, I'll do it. And I went and ate. And because and, uh, what's the first thing you do after you fast? You eat, man. Otherwise, you're still fasting. Let's be honest. The only way to, what else can you do after you fast but eat? And, uh, and we got permission. They gave us six weeks. The, the note, the school board right. We'll give you six weeks in Wildemar School to start your church, establish your congregation, and find a building in Wildemar. With a thousand people in the town in those days. What a bunch of rats. But I'll take my six weeks. And that's what God gave us, and everything has been fine, and we're okay, and and uh, by his grace. Now, and uh, if you just want to, one quick thing, look at Ezra 8, and it's late, but 
uh, Ezra chapter 8 and look down at verse 21. Ezra had led the people of God. This is before Nehemiah. They had left Babylon with a lot of wealth. The Jewish people had lavished on them and, and the king had given them all kinds of wealth to rebuild the temple. And so, uh, and, and Ezra, big mouth Christian, he said, God will take care of us, we're going to go. And the king offered him some guards because they had all the gold and treasures. And they said, oh no, God will take care of us. They got outside of town. They said, man, this is, we're going 800 miles and we're in trouble. You know, we need to call in the National Guard or somebody here. And so if you look at verse 21, Ezra chapter 8, verse 21. And I proclaimed to fast there. They stopped by this river. I, uh, they proclaimed to fast there at the river of Ahiva, uh, uh, Ahiva and uh, that we might afflict ourselves. Now, that's an interesting word, that we might afflict ourselves. David said, when I wept and uh, fasted and uh, he afflicted his soul. All right, so there's some personal denial here that we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones and for our substance. For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way because we'd spoken, um, we'd spoken unto the king saying the hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him. But his power and his wrath is against them that forsake him. So we fasted. <laughs> We've been bragging on God. Oh, God, please don't let us down. It's your name. It's at stake. Now, fasting is between you and God. It's for as long as you want. It's for however you want. But, and I've just shown you six or eight examples. They're, they're all through the Bible. Fasting, there's nothing wrong with it. And, and you figure out how you want to do it. And some of you, I know, with, I don't know how you do it if you have diabetes and things like that. But I'd encourage you young people. Um, I'd encourage you, the first time I preached in a, in a serious way, I, I fasted um, basically for the week before. And I think I ate some in, on Wednesday or something. But anyway, um, you know, I only, I only ate peanut butter and jelly sandwiches or whatever. But uh, if you want something from God, I'm just telling you, fasting opens the door a little wider. You, you can't demand anything. He's God. But scripturally... There's enough reason to say, I want this, God. I want a child to the barren couple. I want a, I want a job. I've got to have a job. God, I need you. Or you're working maybe far from home and you want a job here, or whatever it might be. Um, and there's nothing wrong with fasting. Um, I think Jonathan Ashcraft's probably done some fasting with their situation. Um, we, we ought to fast for our country. We ought to fast for our church. We ought to fast for our families. Uh, the t a teenager right now, uh, Nate Patton, is just about to start, uh, maybe he has started having a couple of meetings. He and Marissa uh, raising support to go to the mission field. Uh, if I was starting out deputation, I'd fast. Oh, God, help me get to the right church. Help me get to some really rich churches, Lord, right? Let me get to the mission field. Don't make me spend three years getting support. Oh, God, help me. <laughs> Fasting's Bible. And uh, it's totally between you and the Lord. Uh, you want to, you know, you want to give up coffee. That's a fast. It's not very sacrificial, but you want to give up diet soda. That would be a sacrifice. <laughs> but uh, you do as God leads. Father, help us to be a little bit more yielded. And we are, we are such uh, well-fed and cared for people. And uh, we, we probably need to do some fasting just to keep this old flesh under control. Paul said, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. And we maybe need a little bit more of that, but it's between you and your people, and so help us. And, and I do pray, Lord, that we would seek your face. We, we want you to help our country. We want you to help our churches across the land. In our church, we want our church, Lord, blessed and preserved and to prosper. We ask God for your help. Please um, use us and bless us and draw us to you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.